Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's event. I just wanted to let you know we will start in about two minutes to allow uh, the last uh, participants to, to switch over to this call and join us. So hang tight for a couple of minutes and we'll be in uh, kickoff soon. Thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Alexander von Rosenbach, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this ICCT live briefing. I am the interim director of the International Center for Counterterrorism, and uh, this is uh, a commitment that we have to engage in a public debate and discussion on uh, key topics of the day and on uh, important academic and, and po policy making work that uh, we are happy to support. Um, Today, I, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you to uh, a briefing on the subject of how terror evolves, the emerging and spread of terrorist techniques, which is based on a book uh, by the same name written by Dr. Yannick villieu lepage um, In a minute, I will introduce you to uh, Yannick and to our two discussants for today. Um, but first, I wanted to give a brief introduction to those uh, who are not familiar with ICCT uh, to our work. Um, as many of you know, ICCT was founded on a single conviction, and that is that the uh, long-term security in the counterterrorism space is best informed by counterterrorism practice and policy that is rooted in and guided by human rights and the rule of law. Now, if we think back, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, um, we know what failure looks like. Uh, we saw it, you know, 20 years ago almost now in the corridors of Abu Ghraib. Uh, we've seen it more recently in the destruction of Aleppo and other cities in the in, in the uh, umbrella of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. We see documented human rights abuses and rule of law violations around the world by security forces. And we also see it here in Europe related to continuing challenges of citizenshiping, uh, of repatriation of foreign terrorist fighters and other issues. Um, and that uh, leads to our real our mission, which is uh, quite straightforward and, and focuses on three main activities. The first is to drive forward uh, with research to prove the assumption that we, uh, the conviction that we have through evidence-based research. The second uh, effort that we focus on is to share what we find through events like these, through the ICCT journal, which I, I hope many of you have read, and through closed door and, and more intimate settings with the key stakeholders that we work with. The third and, and uh, the most uh, perhaps under uh, under uh, promoted uh, part of ICCT's work uh, follows that research into practice and into policy settings. So we actually do a lot of capacity building and implementation with uh, local partners, uh, local communities around the world from West Africa to the Balkans to Southeast Asia. And uh, through those focuses on research, uh, public 
knowledge sharing and through implementation, we feel we deliver quite uh, a robust package of, of, of impact in, in this field. Um, so if that's interesting to you, if this event is interesting to you, I really hope that you uh, go to our website, learn more about what we do, read some of our important research uh, generated by amazing scholars like you'll hear from today, and sign up to our newsletter, uh, follow us on social media to, um, to hear more and, and follow as we continue to, to, to track trends and, and issues uh, in the space of CT and PCVE. Um, that is, I think, enough to say on ICCT. I, I'm very excited now to introduce you to our speakers today. We have three. First, of course, you'll hear from uh, Yannick himself, who will walk you through the core uh, findings of his book, uh, dealing with emergence and spread of terrorist techniques. Yannick is a, an assistant professor of terrorism and political violence at Leiden University here in the Netherlands. And he is also uh, a senior research associate at the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security and Society. Yannick holds a doctorate in international relations from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And after uh, Yannick walks through his, uh, his approach, uh, we'll be joined on the line by two discussants. Uh, the first will be Dr. Maura Conway, who is the Patty Moriarty Professor of Government and International Studies in the School of Law and Government at Dublin City University. And she is also the coordinator of VoxPol, which is an EU funded project on violent online political extremism. The second discussion we'll have today uh, is Tim Wilson, who is the director of the Handa Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews. Last year, he published a book about terrorism in a historical perspective called Killing Strangers, How Political Violence Becomes the, Became Modern, excuse me. Um, so I'm about to hand over to, to Yannick to start, but I wanted to close this session with just some short housekeeping notes. Uh, firstly, it's important to recognize that we will have a Q&A session dedicated at the end of this event, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 minutes. So please uh, use the Q&A tool, which you should be able to find somewhere down here to ask those questions at any time through the event. Uh, we will gather them up and uh, myself and the other panelists will uh, work through them uh, in uh, towards the end of the session. Um, and the other thing to note is when you do leave at the end of the session, there will be a prompt to uh, fill out a post-event survey. And that is our way of assessing whether this event and events like it are, are relevant to our community, to those who listen. So please just take a minute. It's three questions. It literally takes 10 seconds uh, per question. So you're in and out in a minute um, to, to help us gear and calibrate our events uh, better in the future. Um, that would be really, really helpful, and, and uh, we would look forward to hearing from you. Without further ado, uh, Yannick, I'm, I believe the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Let me just share my screen. Take a short second. And I have just noticed that we have lost Yannick off of this call. Uh, so such is the way with uh, with uh, the digital Corona world that we live in. Uh, if you'll all be patient, we'll just wait for him to pop back in. I'm not sure which button he clicked, but uh, yeah, we will find him and uh, look forward to hearing from him as soon as he pops back in here. Um, let's just see where we can find him. Ah, here we are. Yep. Back in business, Yannick. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Thank you. You would think that after a year of pandemic, <laughs> these things would no longer happen, but it seems the longer this go on, the more the technical issues become compounded. <laughs> no, um, I'm glad to go for it. I'll hand you it over now. So let me start by thanking uh, the entire staff ICCT for organizing this event, but also uh, our two discussants, Professor Conway and Dr. Tim Wilson for, for agreeing to serve as discussants. Now, before I start talking about the, the book itself, I think it's helpful to situate a bit this research and some of the events that helped me formulate uh, the theoretical framework that I'm gonna talk about and particularly there's two events that occurred during the summer 
of 2017, which were quite instrumental in developing my thinking. So the first one was a London Bridge attack, uh, which was a vehicle ramming attack and a maraudering uh, stabbing attack that took place near uh, Bora Market. And that was committed by three individuals that had links uh, to the Islamic states. Now, what was particularly interesting to me was that two weeks after the London Bridge attack, there's an individual named Darren Osborne who had links with far right uh, groups in the United Kingdom who drove down from North England and essentially targeted um, uh, worshippers that were leaving the Finsbury Park Mosque uh, after evening prayer. And he took his vehicle and crashed into uh, this crowd of individuals. And when he was apprehended, he, he shouted, he yelled, uh, I did this for, for London Bridge. I want to kill all Muslims. I did my bit. And as I was reflecting on these two events and on vehicle ramming kind of more widely, there's three questions that started kind of keeping me up awake at night. And the first one was, how do new terrorist techniques come about? So how did a technique like vehicle ramming, for example, emerge? What are the drivers for tactical innovation uh, by terrorist groups? Secondly, I was interested in understanding how do these techniques spread? So vehicle ramming was invented within the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So how was this eventually spread to the repertoire of contention of, of jihadis and the repertoire of contentions of, of far-right extremists? And lastly, what explains why a particular technique might be adopted by a certain group, by a certain, uh, uh, by a certain group, by certain individuals, while others may not be? And we know looking at various terrorist groups that not all terrorist groups use the same technique. There's quite a bit of uh, variation in what is used by, by these different groups. So those were kind of the three large research questions that, that kept me up at night for, for several years and still keep me up at night today. But what I sought to do in my book is to present a theoretical framework that's going to, to unpack these questions and explain throughout this presentation how I think about these three elements of terrorist innovation. So how do techniques come about? How do they spread? And lastly, why are they selected in or simply ignored by other group? Now, in order to do so, I draw on a, a theoretical framework, which is loosely based on Darwinian evolution. And what I mean by this is that I'm looking at a very complex system and I'm asking three questions. So the first one has to do with how does something new emerge? So we're not looking at, at genes, but rather we're looking at techniques. So how does innovation take place? The second question has to do with transmission. So again, we've got this linked uh, to this kind of wider theoretical framework that comes with Darwinian evolution. But we're asking here, how do techniques spread rather than asking how do genes spread, for example? And lastly, what is the mechanism that leads a particular group to choose to retain a particular technique because they see it as beneficial, whereas another group might decide to reject a technique uh, as harmful to their wider objectives. So this is essentially a large overview of the framework itself. And what I'd like to do in the next 27 minutes or so is talk you through these three elements. So the first question that I want to answer is, how do new terrorist techniques emerge? So what is the source for innovation itself? Now, in my research, I start by positing that terrorist innovation is motivated by two important factors. The first one is a problem-solving attitude. So essentially, new innovations will come about as a way of solving society, uh, solving particular problems that terrorist groups are faced with. The second is this question of a competitive advantage. So terrorist groups are in constant struggles with law enforcement, with the state, with counter-terrorist uh, practitioners, but also at times with other terrorist groups. And there's an impetus for innovation. By innovating, groups are able to have this particular competitive advantage over their adversaries. And we'll talk about in a few minutes about how this kind of plays out 
in real life. Now, when I'm looking at the potential source of innovation, there's three kind of hypotheses that I bring forward, or three sources that I've identified. So the first one is change in security environment. And this is a theme that we're going to go back to on several occasions throughout this talk. It's essentially this notion that when the security environment changes, terrorists will seek to respond to this by innovating. The second one is what I call changing the understanding of the inner working of society, which is really just like a fancy way of saying change in technology. So when there's new emerging technology, there's an opportunity for terrorist innovation that comes about. And lastly, and this is potentially the most contentious argument that I make, it's that terrorist innovation is also influenced by state counterterrorism action. In many cases, what we can see is it seems that new terrorist innovations are actually an attempt to mimic the state's use of violence. And we'll walk through these three sorts of variation one by one in a bit more detail. So I think when we're kind of talking about this change in security environment, one of the best ways that we can see how states action and countermeasures can lead to innovation is by looking at one of the kind of most famous case study of airplane hijacking, which happened in the summer of 1968, when the PFLP successfully hijacked an LL flight, LL 426. Uh, and this was the first hijacking by a Palestinian group. Now, immediately in the aftermath of this hijacking, we see two new security measures that are introduced uh, by LL. Al. The first one is the introduction of Sky Marshal, so essentially undercover security agents on the planes that are armed and, and are trained to, to try to prevent a hijacking uh, in progress. The second security measure that's introduced in the immediate aftermath of LL 426 is the introduction uh, of profiling by uh, LL agents. And this is done at various stages of boarding, uh, agents were trained at the, at the ticket counter, at the baggage counter, in order to detect what was believed to be kind of telltale sign that, that somebody uh, might have a nefarious uh, intent in, in boring that flight. And we see several occasions where uh, terrorist attacks on LL flights were actually stopped as a result of, of this, this profiling. But what's quite interesting is that we also see in the kind of more medium term, a quick innovation adaptation to these security measures by the PFLP splinter group. So for example, this PFLP GC general command changes its tactic and starts to, to uh, favor uh, targeting LL flights with explosives as opposed to using uh, hijackers as a result of this increased security presence on the flights. We also see that the PFLP EO executive, uh, uh, PFLP external uh, operation uh, splinter starts recruiting foreign operatives, uh, notably from, from Japan, but also from um, South America to essentially act as freelancer um, in, in hijacking these planes with the hopes of being able to, to circumvent these, uh, these in the introduction of, of profiling by LL flight. So this is just kind of this very quick snapshot of how changes in security environment in real life can put an impetus towards a change in um, a, a change in the way these groups are operating. The next thing that we see is the emergence of, kind of new technologies and new terrorist actors seizing on new technologies. And this in many ways is, is probably the least kind of contentious arguments I'm making. Several other scholars have made very similar arguments, but I think this is one of the places where it's worth kind of stepping back and, and just kind of looking at the broader history of political violence. And I think one of the things that's particularly interesting with this notion of terrorists using new technologies is how quickly they seize on to these emerging technologies. So even if we, we go back in history and we start looking at the history of firearms, for example, we see the invention of the flintlock musket in Europe in 1550. 
And 20 years later, you've got the first assassination of, of a head of state with a firearm. And 14 years after that, you have the first assassination uh, using a handgun, the assassination of, of William the Silent. So even 400 years ago, we start seeing how quickly politically minded actors will seize on emerging technologies to carry out acts of political violence. We also see the same thing more recently with the invention of dynamite. So you've got dynamite, which is invented in 1867. And then within roughly 15 years or so, it becomes uh, one of the favorite instrument of Russian anarchists who not only favor dynamite because um, of, the, of its ease of use uh, and if it's of uh, destructive power, but also because of the symbolism that comes behind uh, uh, dynamite attacks. We also see later on in 1910, the first car bomb. So something that may not have been possible with other more rudimentary explosives. And in 1915, uh, an attempt on the US vice president using a letter bomb. So again, this is a form of, uh, this is a particular terrorist tactic that wouldn't be possible prior to the invention of dynamite. It'd be extremely difficult to, to create a mail bomb using you know, a, a barrel of you know, low-grade gunpowder, uh, or it'd be very difficult to create a mail bomb using an explosive that's much less stable than, than dynamite. So the, the emergence of dynamite, the invention of dynamite, really changed the way that various actors were able to, to engage in acts of political violence. Now, having gone kind of you know far in the, the past, I think it's worth going to, to our present to near future. Um, and this is where I start kind of thinking about the next frontiers of emerging technologies and how they can possibly be used uh, by, by terrorist actors. So there's a lot of talk about the use of adhesive technology, so 3D printed weapon. We started seeing, at least we saw an example of this uh, last year during the Halle. Uh, synagogue shooting where parts of the weapons were built using 3D printed uh, technology. And most importantly, the shooter's manifesto explained his use of 3D uh, printed weapon or, or partly 3D printed weapon as essentially a, um, a, a trial and error process or a, a proof of concept for future attackers um, going forward. We've also seen as a great deal has been written, uh, including by myself and, and my colleague Emile Archambault on the weaponization uh, of drones. So there's several uh, terrorist groups that have now weaponized drones and used them on large scales, uh, including the Islamic State and uh, Houthi rebels who have successfully killed people using commercial drones that drop small explosives. But even going all the way back to 1994, we can see the first drone plot uh, by, by the Japanese def cult, uh, Amshom Rikyo, who sought to use uh, RC helicopters or remote control helicopters uh, as a mechanism to spray uh, nerve agent. Fortunately, that, 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 that plot failed because they crashed both their helicopters. But we can see how this technology that we're now kind of worried about how terrorists might use, well, terrorists have been mindful of this technology for the past 20 years or so. And then this is where I think another frontier, which is underexplored, uh, and it's worth keeping an eyes out, is the, the possibilities that are offered by gene editing or biohacking technologies, which are becoming much more affordable. You can buy you know, CRISPR kits on, on the internet to do your own gene editing you know, experiments at home for a couple hundred dollars. So there's questions about, you know, what is the potential that comes with this new technology? Now, when I'm thinking about how commercial technologies can be employed uh, for nefarious purposes, there's always two places I like to go. And these are, I think, sources that are drastically underutilized by terrorism scholars. And I like to look at how criminals and hobbyists are using these technologies as a bit of a warning sign for what's coming in the future. So if we kind of go back to this idea of, of drones, we know that criminal elements have been using drones to deliver weapons, drugs, pornography, cell phones into prison for over 20 years. And we see thousands of cases 
of drones being used in this type of activity every year uh, throughout the Western world. Also, if you kind of want to understand a bit the, the kind of larger technological capability, I think this is one of the places where it's worth going and looking at what people are doing, what hobbyists are doing. So while the weaponization uh, of commercial drone is relatively recent uh, for terrorist groups, if you go on YouTube, you can find you know, a, an assortment of videos by, by hobbyists who have mounted you know, handguns, machine guns, flamethrowers, rocket launchers on commercial drones. So often, these are places where it's worth kind of going to see if you want an idea of how technologies are going to be used in the future. And I think this is one of the lessons that I hope that, that I empower in my book. And this really comes back to one of the main takeaway I got from the 9-11 report, which essentially called the 9-11 attack essentially a failure in imagination or, or the lack of, of um, the, the inability to prevent the 9-11 attack was a failure in imagination on behalf of the intelligence services. And this call to find a way to routinize or even bureaucratize the exercise of imagination. So I think when we're looking at new technologies, it's really important that we don't only have blinders on by saying this is how terrorists are currently using this technology, but rather we start thinking about how criminals are using new technologies and how hobbyists are using new technologies and what possibilities that might offer for politically minded um, individuals. Now, the third source of, of, very, of innovation that I identify is this effort to mimic the state's use of violence. And I've put a couple of examples here, and I'm sure people are able to think about many more examples of terrorist groups trying to mimic state's violence. But I think one of the ones that's kind of the most interesting to me really has to do with the early days of aviation and hijacking. So often in terrorism literature, we kind of talk about hijacking emerging in the 1960s. But actually, if you step back, we see that the first hijacking event took place in 1931 in Peru. And what's quite fascinating is that it emerges directly as an attempt to mimic the state's use of violence. So during a, a, uh, a revolt in Peru, the Peruvian government had a contract with Pan Am, which is a, an airline, a mail carrying airline, that essentially said that in the event of a national emergency, Pan Am pilots had to essentially be conscribed to do the bidding of the Peruvian government. So the Peruvian government started using these planes, these Pan Am planes, to drop propaganda on rebel strongholds. Now, as that was happening, uh, one of these planes landed and it was captured uh, by these rebels and they put the pilot on trial and just kind of like this old court martial trial. And that's not particularly important. What's particularly important is after the, that had happened, the Peruvian rebels started targeting airfields, capturing the planes, and rather than putting the pilots on trial, forcing the pilots in turn to go and drop propaganda on government held uh, territory. So here we can see how even at the early days uh, of hijacking, there's this effort by non-state actors, by terrorist individuals to mimic the use uh, of violence that's done by the states. And, and, and there's several other examples. I think one of the ones that's probably kind of the most striking and the most common to us is the similarities in, in the jumpsuits uh, between the one that uh, were used in Guantanamo Bay and the ones that are used in ISIS propaganda. So this gives us kind of a rough overview of innovation itself. And what are some of the drivers for innovation? What are some of the source of this innovation? I then want to kind of move on and talk about transmission, which is essentially how is it that a technique that is invented in one context, how can it spread to another context? Now, kind of wider literature on, on the transmission of, of ideas, on the transmission of language, on the transmission uh, of rituals and, and uh, cultural artifacts essentially tells us that there's two ways transmission can occur. The first one is relational ties. And this is essentially means it's between actors through this like interpersonal network. 
And the second one has is non-relational ties. And that essentially means that there's a third party involved. Now, how does this kind of play out in real life? So relational ties occurred in when, when there's a kind of face-to-face -face contact uh, and there's this kind of teacher-learner relationship that's developed. And this is generally the best way to transmit information. This allows the learner to ask questions, to ask for clarification, and, and so on. And we know that terrorist groups will have several strategic uh, incentives to collaborate. And that might be in order to facilitate the, the sharing of resources, uh, of training, but also of lessons learned. And perhaps one of the best example of terrorist techniques being transmitted through this kind of face-to-face -face contact can be seen in, in a case that occurred in 2001, where there's three individuals that had links with the provisional IRA in Northern Ireland were arrested in Colombia. And soon after their arrests, Colombian authorities started discovering car bombs, which were strikingly similar to the car bombs that were manufactured in Northern Ireland. So the belief here is that these three individuals were sent or went to Colombia in order to train FARC members in this particular technique of the car bomb. And there's many more examples of this kind of transmission happening through individuals, through this kind of movement uh, of teachers going somewhere and, and teaching, instructing people on a new techniques. But we also have many cases where this relational transmission just doesn't make sense. It, it, it can't have occurred. So the first one has to do with the Japanese Red Army who were quite prolific in airplane hijacking. Um, but they started hijacking planes prior to establishing links with the PFLP. So this kind of notion of, of them being trained by the PFLP just doesn't make any sense. We also know that the, the Jewish Defense League tried to hijack a plane in uh, 1972. And again, very unlikely that they would have received any type of like, training by uh, any you know, Palestinian organization at the time. So in the absence of relational ties, we can start looking at the role of non-relational ties, which is essentially the notion that some groups will copy a technique by observing it from afar, by reading media report, by seeing videos online. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting with non-relational ties is that this is where kind of copy errors occur. Because you can't ask questions, because you can't ask clarification, individuals are kind of left to their own device and guessing how, uh, how to orchestrate or how to use this new technique. So we know that when the Japanese Red Army decided to, um, to hijack a uh, plane the first time, they weren't exactly sure how to behave within the plane. So they rented out a hotel room, sorry, a hotel conference room and they rearranged all the chairs in the same way uh, as a plane in order to practice the movement and moving around because they didn't have anybody who had this experience within the organization of hijacking a plane and kind of circling around passengers and, and whatnot. Now, the third aspect I kind of want to talk to is moving on to this notion of selection. And the question of selection essentially seeks to explain why a particular technique is going to be accepted or rejected by a particular group. And we know that not every group uses the same technique. And there's probably no bet, better example to, to illustrate this from looking at suicide bombing. So suicide bombing has been used by several groups, but at the same time, there's a lot of other groups that are part of these like very protracted, very violent conflicts that never start using suicide bombing. So why is that? Um, and there's kind of the easy answer, which is a, there's a religious factor, but I don't think that's satisfactory because we have, we, if we look at the groups that are using suicide bombing, there isn't a, a, a monopoly of one particular religion in there. Suicide bombing has been used by several uh, groups with different ideological and religious kind of underpinnings. So there's got to be more to it to explain why a particular group will or will not use a new technique. And essentially here, I kind of just go back to the early literature on, on terrorism, which tells us that terrorists are, are rational actors that try to like maximize uh, 
their uh, maximize um, the, their outcome goals. And I bring forward that there's three important preconditions that helps us understand why a technique will be used or not. So the first one has to do with feasibility. So the structural precondition and the limitation of resources. The second one has to do with the legitimacy. So how legitimate is a technique in the eyes of those who are going to employ it? And the last is how effective is that particular technique in accomplishing its goal? So quickly going through these three uh, selection criteria, feasibility essentially refers to whether a technique can be employed. And there's two factors that can come into play here. So a technique can simply not be feasible to a group because they'll lack the technical uh, knowledge to, to engage in it, uh, or simply it, 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 there's a lack of kind of structural preconditions for it. So for example, you couldn't invent the mail bomb before the invention of dynamite and so on. But also most importantly, reducing feasibility is essentially the cornerstone of a lot of counterterrorism measures. And we do this by limiting accesses to, to, to resources. So like using raids and seizures of assets, using you know, controls of good. You know, I can't go to the hardware store and buy a ton of ammonium nitrate. Uh, fertilizer. And the reason for that is this is an effort by the government to reduce the feasibility of somebody, you know, uh, building a, a fuel air bomb, like in the case of the Oklahoma City bombing. So that's the first precondition is how feasible is a particular technique compared to another technique. But this is where it gets a bit tricky, is that we do know that there's a substitution effect that comes in. So if you make one technique less feasible, other techniques in comparison become more feasible and therefore are going to be favored. Um, and there's a great deal of literature that was written about this looking at, at uh, metal detectors. So we know that when metal detectors were introduced in the United States in 1973, it led to a drastic reduction of airplane hijacking, but it led to a proportional increase in kidnapping and assassination attempts. So this is something to kind of keep in mind as well when crafting counterterrorism uh, strategies, which are aimed solely at feasibility. The second aspect has to do with the question of legitimacy. And essentially that has to do with their normative preferences. So what tech or what group technique, what target does a group think is legitimate? And lastly, constitution, uh, constitutionally uh, cost, which is essentially the the wider claim of uh, the, the wider group to which the terrorist group is trying to, to uh, appeal to. And this, is, this cost is particularly clear if we look, for example, at why the PRA decided to reject the use of proxy bombs. And proxy bombs are these pretty insidious uh, technique where you essentially kidnap somebody's family and then you force someone to drive a bomb laden vehicle to a particular destination, and then you detonate the vehicle with the person inside. And this is something that the PRA did on three occasions, but when they did so, they received an enormous backlash uh, from the North Irish, uh, uh, sorry, from, from Protestants, uh, sorry, from Republicans in Northern Ireland, but also from the Irish community in the United States. Uh, and in many ways, that technique was so unpopular by uh, to the, the people that PRA was trying to, to appeal to, that they essentially stopped using uh, proxy bombs. Now, lastly, the last case that, the last uh, selection mechanism that comes into play is this question of effectiveness, right? So a technique that is deemed effective or that is likely to be, uh, to lead to the, the outcome goal that a group want, is going to be favored. Now, the problem here is that it's very difficult to measure how effective a technique is going to be. And it's very hard for, for sociologists to do, and it's even harder for terrorists to figure this out. And really, it can only be figured out by putting it into, into practice. And this is one of the things that I found in my book is that groups who were successful in their first, uh, first few attempts with a particular technique 
would continue to repeat using that particular technique. So groups that were successful in their first few hijackings continue to try hijacking planes despite you know, subsequent failures. Whereas groups who were unsuccessful in hijacking a plane in their first two attempts essentially stopped all uh, operations to hijack planes and moved on to other particular technique. And then there's two very interesting examples here. One of them is the PRA who tried to hijack two planes and the Jewish Defense League who tried to hijack one plane. Both, uh, both these groups failed on their occasion and then never sought to do it again. So kind of in summary, just kind of tie this all in together. There's essentially three main contentions that I, I've made here. So the first one is this notion that terrorist innovation is motivated by this problem solving uh, approach. And in order to overcome constraints in the security environment that results from this competitive relationship with, with adversaries, whether they're state or, uh, or other terrorist groups. The second argument I make here is that adoption is far more likely than innovation. And what I mean by this is when we see new technique emerging, it's worth taking time and asking ourselves, is this something that's brand new? or as it emerged somewhere else, and then the technique was transported either through relational or non-relational ties. And lastly, it's the argument that innovation and adoption are sensitive to these preconditions. So the feasibility, the legitimacy, and the effectiveness. And all of these three factors can be, can be played with, can be changed for particular techniques through different counterterrorism measures. And we can talk about that kind of moving forward. But I guess there's three main kind of policy takeaway based on this. So the first one is that in order to look, in order to understand how new technologies are going to be employed, I think it's important to catalog the any incidents. So what we call protest event, uh, a protest incident analysis, where you essentially catalog every incident of this particular technology being used for malevolent purposes. And when you do so, don't only focus on terrorist group, also look at what the hobbyists are doing, start looking at what the criminals are doing as well. Secondly, when you're trying to understand uh, innovation and adoption, it's important that we start looking at the kind of wider societal context in which innovation comes from. Uh, also at the role of the state within these innovation. And lastly, I think it's quite important that governments remain quite open-minded when we're doing this kind of forward for forecasting and that it thinks about who it brings in as advisors in order to create these like meaningful exchange of ideas. And when you're talking about kind of creative malevolence, this is where I think it's particularly important to bring people from industry, people that are working on 3D printing, people that are working on on drone technology, but also bring people whose entire career are linked to this notion of creativity, bring in screenwriters, bring in people uh, that are able to, to imagine how technologies are going to be used in the future to not repeat this error of not bureaucratizing uh, imagination. So this gives you guys a, a very brief overview uh, of the framework of my book and some of my thinking, and I, I look forward to, to hearing your comments and your question, uh, questions in due time. Super, thank you, Yannick. Uh, I love the, the, the note that you end on there, particularly the policy uh, recommendations, but that notion of creative malevol uh, malevolence uh, is really a, a fascinating one. I, I'd love to pick that up in our discussion, but I don't wanna take up too much time because I wanna immediately hand the floor to Dr. Conway uh, to provide some immediate reflections on, uh, on Yannick's uh, points. Okay. Thanks, uh, Alexander, uh, for the intro. Uh, many thanks, uh, Yannick, both for your um, presentation this afternoon, uh, but also for your book, which is which is really great. C congrats on that. It's a, I would say, it's a very detailed, uh, lucid, uh, enjoyable, actually, um, if if I could use that word, um, analysis of the evolution of airplane uh, hijacking as a terrorist uh, technique. Uh, as I was reading it, uh, you know, um, I was reminded of the freakishly large number of, uh, of, of airplane um, hijackings that um, have taken place 
at, at various uh, periods. Uh, and uh, I, I was also, um, it also caused me to go to YouTube and to uh, check out some of the footage uh, from some of the uh, more infamous events and uh, particularly the, the events at Dawson's uh, Field. And um, for anybody who has read Yannick's book or intends to uh, read the book, uh, I, I point you to some of that footage because it's very interesting and it's illustrative um, of a lot of the things that uh, Yannick uh, has to say. Um, as some of you will know, uh, my major interest is in the intersections of extremism, terrorism, and the internet. And so um, I guess what I wanted to reflect on is um, how Yannick's framework, so his ideas about uh, evolution and, and this framework um, of evolutionary theory, if you like, um, might play out um, with respect to uh, online technologies uh, in particular. But, but then um, I, I thought, uh, hang on a minute, uh maybe it's it's less about some particular technology in this case and, and maybe it's more about communication as as a meta or uh if you like or technique um which can then be divided into a, a variety of um sub techniques uh if you like because really from terrorism's genesis um there's been this recognition on the part of terrorists that the violence doesn't actually speak for itself. The terrorism doesn't actually uh, speak for itself. So th there's always been um, this requirement to, to solve this problem um, that it doesn't speak for itself. And so, so communication, um, as, as many, many people um, have pointed out, is, is integral uh, uh, to uh, terrorism. So I wanted to start off with my, my quick remarks and, and, and talk about communication as a sort of a meta level uh, technique, because what that does is it gives us, I think, the greatest uh, scope in terms of both time and types, uh, if you like. So the variety of techniques. And Ryan Scrivens and I um, have a chapter titled The Roles of Old and New Media Tools and Technologies in the Facilitation of Violent Extremism and Terrorism. And um, it, it says, uh, basically, it does what it says, basically, uh, on the tin. So it, it, it really um, goes through and it describes a whole host of old uh, and newer technologies and their roles of violent extremism and terrorism. And I think one of the things that it does, um, and that's similar to what Yannick it, it does in his book and is interested in more broadly, is that it takes history uh seriously um and so what ryan and i did in, in that chapter which is uh, open access uh on the internet um is uh we start and we we discuss low what we call low tech uh, media tools and, and the first category category we talk about actually are um, what we term pre-media um, and what we mean by that is word of mouth uh, wall paintings, which covers, you know, graffiti and murals uh, and, and the like. And then we go on and we talk about print um, and photocopying, including newspapers, magazines, billboards uh, and that type of thing. And then our second category uh, that we term high tech media tools, we divide into two. Uh, again, so the first is sound and vision, uh, radio, film, television, and the second we term online multimedia. And that online multimedia, we divide further, and we talk about a web 1.0, so bulletin board systems, websites, and online forums, uh, and b what is often termed web 2.0, in other words, digital video uh, and social uh, media. And importantly, I think uh, to say here is that we treated all this in respect of uh, jihadis on the one hand and the extreme right uh, on the other hand. And, and we also talked about some others. So uh, mentioned in Yannick's presentation was uh, Hezbollah uh, and also provisional IRA. And, and, and we addressed uh, some of their um, activity with, with respect uh, to some of these communicative techniques uh, also. And 
why we use this term um, evolving, we use the term evolve uh, uh, at the beginning um, of our uh, chapter. There's a bunch of things that we didn't do um, uh, and now reflecting on it and, and, and having um, been introduced to Yannick's framework, um, I, I, I think we usefully could have done, uh, if you like. And so um, we didn't make the evolutionary aspects of this shift from um, pre-media to low-tech media to high-tech media. Um, we didn't make that evolution uh, explicit, uh, if you want. And in particular, we didn't detail, we didn't even think about, to be honest with you, too much, who learned what from whom uh, and in what specific order. Uh, nor indeed, number three, how those developments were affected by extremists and terrorist users' interactions with other powerful actors, whether um, in the early part of things, uh, governments, or more recently, for example, uh, internet uh, companies. And I have to say that on reflection, um, I think that all of these would have been um, useful lines to pursue. Nonetheless, one of the things that I can say is that um, when, when we reflect on this um, evolution of terrorist communication techniques and technologies, I think that an important outcome of the analysis is nonetheless to sort of challenge this fairly commonplace idea that the so-called Islamic states um, use of the internet was extraordinary or revolutionary, if you like, and thereby also unforeseen uh, and unforeseeable. Um, in our chapter, we, 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 we actually sort of focus on the comparative aspects more. So, so how, um, you know, the activity uh, over time uh, of jihadis and the extreme right and others, how a, a lot of the things that they did uh, uh, are quite similar communicatively, uh, regardless uh, of their core ideologies. Um, but like I say, um, a usefulness, I think, to this kind of an approach, and, and Yannick makes this point in his book about 9-11, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, it, it de-exceptionalizes uh, particular uh, types uh, of terrorist uh, attacks uh, or events uh, th that actually have, e have evolved over time, even though they, they can be quite spectacular and look as if they're unique, they're not uh, particularly unique if you reflect on them uh, in some kind of detail. Having said all that, I think using Yannick's framework, uh, you know, to, to, to treat all of the different types of communication techniques uh, that, that I've uh, just described uh, would be a very, very uh, significant uh, undertaking. So then I thought, okay, well, what might be a sort of a, a better approach and, and maybe a more useful idea uh, is to treat some particular uh, communicative type approach. And in fact, uh, Ryan Scrivens again and Logan McNair and I have a ICCT, uh, in fact, report that looks at the persistence of the online uh, extreme right. And so what we do there is we look at a particular technique, if you like, uh, online or the internet, uh, and, and, and we look at it in the context of a particular ideological grouping, uh, which is the extreme right. And again, one of the things I think this does is usefully de-exceptionalize in particular, I would say recent events. So I don't know if many of you um, probably, uh, like me, um, reflected on the events at the US Capitol uh, in, uh, recently and the way in which they were presented again as something uh, unique, something exceptional. Uh, and, and I would say that this was for um, a variety uh, of reasons, in, in particular the, the location of things and whatnot, but, but nonetheless, um, I, I think that the exceptional nature of them and the role of the internet uh, uh, in that uh, was uh, hugely uh, overstated, uh, to be honest uh, with you. Um, it was as if um, this, again, couldn't have been known uh, in advance and was somehow hugely out of the ordinary. And, and, and this is particularly interesting when you consider that, you know, uh, the August 2019 uh, El Paso Walmart shooting, uh, the 2019 Poway synagogue attack, the March 2019 
Christchurch terrorist attack and even the August uh, 2017 United the uh, Right uh, rally in Charlottesville all had very significant um, online components, all had allied uh, deep platformings associated with them. And in fact, Charlottesville is only uh, 100 miles from DC. So, I mean, uh, this is um, some serious forgetting, I would say, uh, that's going on when we're talking about very recent history with respect uh, to, to the evolving nature of the extreme right and online. But having said that, what's also worth pointing out and what we point out in the ICCT report is that, in fact, the extreme right have been active online for 40 plus years. Uh, at this stage. Uh, so um, really, uh, uh, they were some of the first people, the extreme right were some of the first people to do politics uh, on the internet full stop. Um, and uh, they've persisted in their uh, activity uh, relatively uh, uninterrupted over decades, in fact. So they started off in the very early 1980s uh, using bullet board uh, systems, uh, shifted to websites, then to forums, then to social media, both mainstream uh, and fringe, uh, to messaging applications uh, and, and other uh, online tools and technologies that they're using uh, at the present time. So even a cursory analysis, evolutionary type analysis, if you like, shows that the direction um, of transmission um, is initially um, from the extreme right to others, not the other way around. So I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm saying here is that quite a lot of the time, in fact, today, in media uh, and amongst policymakers uh, and others, uh, a lot of people believe that the extreme right have learned from so-called Islamic State. And indeed, I'm sure they have learned some things. But in terms of the evolution, uh, uh, of uh, extremism and terrorism uh, online. If the extreme right were some of the first people to do any kind of politics in the internet, well then the chain of transmission is from extreme right to other extremists uh, and terrorists. Um, you know, uh, again, um, I, I think it would definitely be useful to elucidate uh, what are probably fairly complicated routes of transmission um, between the extreme right and other um, extremists and terrorist groups uh, as, as things uh, pr progressed. But, no, but number three, you, you know, again, I, I think that's an interesting and worthwhile um, approach to look at sort of online and some specific ideology or indeed uh, group. But um, when, I, when I was, what I eventually came to, I guess, and, and what I think might be the most useful um, approach when thinking about online is, is to look at, to so, at some specific new uh, online uh, technique. And, and what I, uh, right now I think sort of comes closest uh, in terms of Yannick's uh, analysis uh, and, and his focus on, you know, some specific uh, technique that emerged uh, and, and, and then uh, mutated. Um, and, and for me, that's probably um, an analysis of live streaming. Uh, and I think live streaming is, is an interesting one because this was yet another terrorist technique that was treated as unique and dastardly, if you like, uh, not to say even uniquely uh, dastardly, uh, and also without uh, historical uh, precedent. And, and in some respect, and, and Yannick uh, has pointed to this, um, it, it was without precedent in, in the sense that the structural preconditions for online live streaming are only relatively recently uh, available. But having said that, I also think it, it's possible um, uh, to, to, to trace things uh, further back. So I think there's related sort of history, uh, if you like. Um, I've only begun to get this through in the last couple of days, but it seems to me it is all the ingredients identified by Yannick in terms of variation, uh, transmission, uh, and selection. Uh, the, the variation, I would say, goes from the live uh, televising of terrorism, going back as far as the beginnings of, of television, especially 1970, Dawson's Field, 1972, Munich Olympics, the plane hitting the second tower uh, on 9-11, um, his bolas, Al Manar videographers in the 1980s uh, and 1990s, the videoing of atrocities by terrorists for circulating online, including headings from the early 2000s, then the live tweeting of attacks in particular by Al Shabaab in 2013, their live tweeting of the Westgate attack, uh, 
And then we get in Magnaville in 2016, um, Larossi Abala, uh, he kills two police uh, employees and then he live streams um, his sort of justification, if you like, which is basically the first live streaming by a terrorist in the midst of a, an attack by themselves. And then you get infamously the Facebook live stream of the Christchurch terrorist attack and the October 2019 Halle synagogue attack, which was live streamed uh, on Twitch. So uh, in terms of um, Yannick's approach, you know, uh, the propositional knowledge that was available, I would say a lot of it comes probably from uh, first person uh, shooter games, um, the transmission, not direct, but indirect via media. And in terms of selection issues, well, uh, in terms of feasibility, we have, you need mobile um, wireless internet and GoPro uh, technology, mobile phones and whatnot. These were all in use. In terms of legitimacy, um, the live streaming of attacks was uh, absolutely um, applauded uh, by online users in extreme right uh, circles. It's lauded by them widely. And effectiveness, you get a lot of media attention. You have a multiplier effect. The content is out there online. And regardless of the pretty significant efforts taken by a variety of other uh, actors, it still remains um, available for those uh, who want to access it. Uh, so I guess what I would say is that I, I think there's, um, in closing, I guess what I would say is that I think there's a, a, a range of different possibilities in terms of us uh, uh, doing work that treats the evolution um, of in particular sort of uh, terrorist communication uh, techniques in particular, and uh, specifically their use of online uh, tools uh, and technologies. And, and I think one of the things uh, people who are interested online uh, tend to do, in online tend to do uh, finally is to dismiss um, you know, the, the relevance of history, uh, if you like, or, or their idea of history is very immediate uh, history. And, and I suggest that, that that maybe we could begin to think about uh, uh, things uh, with, within some longer uh, trajectory, and that would be a useful thing uh, for us also going forward. Super. Thank you, Mara. I, I wanted to uh, just pick up on that very quickly and note that there is a question in the panel uh, from uh, from a, a participant who is referencing Genghis Khan. So I think there is definitely an ask in here to to look further back in history and to try and find other relevant examples. And, and I hope we can get to that. But I before we get to questions, uh, I wanted to give the floor to Dr. Wilson uh, and I uh, would love to, to hear your thoughts as well. Thanks very much, Alexander. Thank you for the warm welcome to ICCT. Um, as a you know leading hub of terrorism research, it's uh, it's a huge honour to speak this afternoon. A huge honour to share a, a virtual stage virtually um, with the ever far sighted uh, Maura Conway. So thank you for um, that invitation uh, today. And I think you know really the, the first thing that I wanted to do was just on a a very basic and uh, human level, um, acknowledge uh, Yannick's achievement. You know, uh, anyone who has written uh, or tried to write a book like this will know that it's, uh, it has a Churchillian quality of blood, sweat, toil and tears. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to sort of honour the scale uh, of that achievement first and foremost. You know, these books do not drop from heaven, just like terrorist techniques. Uh, they're often the product of enormous um, reflection and experimentation. So um, I'm going to sort of take uh, uh, Alexander's cue there for um, an invitation to look back. Um, if that is your thing, I'm your man. I am that rare thing, a historian who has blundered into terrorism studies. Um, so my view is going to be um, fairly retrospective. Uh, Friedrich Schlegel, the German philosopher in the 19th century, said the historian was the prophet facing backwards. Uh, I think more is very much the prophet facing forwards. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of take the, the other view. Um, but as Moore has said, you know, we need both. There is no clear dividing line between uh, past, present, future. The first thing, though, speaking very much as a historian, is to uh, acknowledge just what Yannick has achieved. You know, I'm not quite sure how Yannick sees uh, himself. He's certainly a very rigorous social scientist with a sort of conceptual precision that I can only envy uh, with my own much more impressionistic mind. Um, but just on a very practical level, I think it is worth stressing that this amount of research is remarkable. It's stakhanovite. 
who was Stakhanov, he was, Alexei Stakhanov was the uh, hero coal miner of the Soviet Union, who in 1935 uh, single-handedly mined 14 times the average coal miner's output. And, you know, this book is a bit like this. It's a kind of heroic feat of single data mining. There's a charming passage on page 44, uh, to be precise, of uh, this book, um, a charming passage on page 44 where Yannick lets slip that, by the way, uh, I've compiled a database of 1,084 incidents of hijacking from 1930 to 2001, and that's four times the number you'll find in the global terrorism database. Um, I think that's an extraordinary achievement for any single scholar within the limited confines and resources of a doctoral topic. So I suppose um, my first um, very uh, basic question, Yannick, is where is the database? How can we, how do we get hold of it? Um, can we have it for CSDBV? No, I'm only joking. It belongs to you and ICCT. But um, what an achievement! Extraordinary uh, and extraordinarily um, useful. Which you know brings me to the second point, which is you know methodological. Uh, you know, more has, has has spoken you know powerfully about um, the need to stress propaganda when we study terrorism, and I think that's right. Um, if I may make a plea, though, it is that we do need a countervailing uh, effort to study deeds as well as words. Um, you know, I have been struck many times by those academics who are studying political violence or terrorism who don't seem very interested in violence at all, uh, at least at a sort of micro level of analysis. They're not really interested in the nitty gritty. They're not really interested in what actually happens. Uh, they're not interested in the, why this type of violence and not that type of violence. And, you know, the clue is in the title. Uh, Yannick's book, How Terror Evolves, is very much interested in those questions. And I think um, the point about stressing that is there's a paradox here. By a sort of obsessive focus on the mi apparently micro detail, the how questions, on the questions on what actually happens and how, one can actually illuminate uh, far wider landscapes of context and causation. And I think it's an enormous strength of Yannick's approach that he is interested in the tinkerers and the criminals, that he does glance sideways. You know, again and again, uh, we see uh, tactics and techniques migrating. Um, bombings of aircraft for insurance purposes, dynamite bombings um, in the 1880s uh, by the Irish American bombers in London have basically been borrowed from the American crime underworld. So again and again, we see a, a transference of techniques. And I think, you know, if we actually paid more attention to um, assumptions and, and imitations, rather than just always foregrounding ideas and ideology, I'm not saying ideology doesn't matter for target selection, clearly it does. Uh, I'm just trying to offer some corrective, as I think um, this book helps to do. And I think you know, what we might get from that is actually a big step forward in writing um, a half decent history of terrorism. Um, because in my own not so humble opinion, uh, a lot of the problem with terrorism studies when it looks backwards is that it is characterized by what I call ripping off Immanuel Kant, uh, but what I call an ahistorical historicism. In other words, the case studies are historical because they just happen to lie in the past, um, but there is very little interest in uh, the history around them that helped produce them. In other words, the past is essentially treated as a kind of giant junkyard challenge. It's a kind of huge heap of scrap out of which we can uh, wrench things out of their context and, and, and try and find uh, some interest in them. And you know the temptation then uh, is to essentially take a definition of terrorism and try and reverse engineer a genealogy. Uh, and that leads us with some really rather strange um, uh, perspectives, I think, of which I'll, um, I'll Velcro my colors to the mast, uh, take a stand. You know, I think the, the, uh, the, the main problem, I mean, usefully, uh, usefully provocative as it is, uh, but the main problem has been the dominance of David Rappaport's four waves theory. Um, you know, his search for giants, 40 year repeating patterns, sort of great rolling breakers, if you like, um, you know, I don't think has been uh, particularly encouraging for this kind of fine grained contextualized account of how new violent techniques 
uh, emerge. It's not that I don't think things happen in waves, but I think we're looking at the wrong sort of waves uh, and we would be much better served looking at sort of short, chaotic, choppy breakers, mimetic flurries, rather than big rolling long 40 year swells. Okay, um, what I think uh, Yannick's approach allows us to do, as I say, is sort of factor in context, what he calls propositional knowledge in all its complexity and its changing incentive structures of technology, uh, economic and social and cultural uh, change. And, you know, I think that does help give us a much richer account of how specific types of barbarism uh, like hijacking actually uh, accelerate and um, develop. But I think it does um, something else also rather remarkable. It helps focus our attention on the gaps, on the history of absences. Um, you know, and I, maybe that may be something Yannick wants to say a, a, a word about afterwards, just to, you know, how one goes about trying to do that. But I do think um, that, you know, one of the most urgent and one of the least recognized challenges in the field of trying to study political violence and terrorism uh, is accounting for the unexplained absences. You know, uh, famously, the, the Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, uh, turns upon a dog that doesn't bark when one might uh, seriously have expected it to bark. Um, history of political violence uh, is like that. And there's whole kennels of uh, strangely silent dogs. Um, there's a sort of whole Cruff's dog show of silent hounds, of horrors that were fully thinkable, techniques that were thought of, perhaps even were tried um, once or twice, or perhaps even for a longer period, and are then allowed uh, to lapse. There's been, to borrow Moore's phrase, some serious forgetting or uh, to adapt uh, Donald Rumsfeld's famous phrase about unknown unknowns and known unknowns. There's also some unknown knowns, things that were known about and then seem to lapse. You know, Yannick talks about firearm assassinations in the late 16th century. By the mid uh, 17th century, they disappear for about 150 years and then they come back. Uh, and we can find more recent uh, examples too. As Yannick himself acknowledges, you know, hijacking seems to be invented in Peru in about 1930 and then reinvented in Cuba, you know, a few decades later. So I think, you know, what, um, what he does uh, very powerfully is, is help focus uh, our minds on what I call tactical warehousing, ideas that are there on the shelf that are fully thinkable, that hang around, uh, but just are often not used or not used much for a very long time. An area that, you know, both he and I are interested in and another database I'll be interested in hearing about um, is vehicle ramming, as you know, Yannick acknowledged uh, himself, that's been a, a, an interest of his for a while. You know, vehicle ramming is a really strange phenomenon. Um, as early as 1904 at the Paris Motor Show, uh, militaries were interested in how you could use a car as a weapons platform. As early as 1917 in race riots in America, drive-by shootings occurred. Um, Yannick came up with a 1910 car bomb I didn't know about, but you know, certainly by the early 20th century, car bombings are, are being experimented with by the mid 20th century, 1947 in Palestine. Uh, they become really quite a routine um, technique. So, you know, uh, vehicles have been used in all kinds of creative ways uh, to change the shape and the dynamics of um, political violence, terrorism, whatever we want to call it. And yet ramming, which is, you know, surely an idea that should have been fairly obvious, uh, has really um, waited till the 21st century to become a standard technique. That delay uh, is something I believe we should be much more curious about, much more puzzled by, much more uh, keen to try and interrogate. And one could replicate examples, suicide bombing, which, you know, appears again in late 19th century Russia and then seems to disappear uh, in my own work, Killing Strangers. I I turned up a whole load of non-political uh, suicide bombings, sort of uh, particularly frustrated and inadequate men um, who sort of seem to blow themselves up with some regularity, you know, simple database search of newspapers throws that stuff up. So, um, you know, why did this not uh, become more of a, a, a widespread political tactic earlier? I'll let that question hang. I don't think it's easy to answer, but I think it is one that we shouldn't be so comfortable in ignoring as we have tended to be. What I think uh, Yannick's work does and Moore's work too, um, also Audrey Cronin's wonderful uh, Power to the People, is signal a sort of uh, a, a turn towards taking 
um, contagion and diffusion seriously as a process in its own right. And I think that must and should be applauded. I want to leave time for questions, so I will just really sum up um, by saying, I remember reading once about Charles Darwin's gardener, you know, evolutionary theory has been quite an inspiration for Yannick in this book. Charles Darwin's gardener apparently was asked what Charles Darwin was like to work uh, for. And apparently he said, well, he was a lovely man, but he didn't half spend a lot of time staring off into the middle distance, not doing very much. Well, you know, of course, what he was doing, staring off into the middle distance was coming up with a theory of evolution and how terror evolves is similarly marinated in deep thought, deep reflection and deep insight. And it is a true pleasure and no platitude to pay it due tribute today. I'll shut up there and hand up back to Alexander. Super, uh, Tim, that's great. And uh, yeah, I think this session, uh, I mean, we have a lot of interesting sessions at ICCT, but this one with both uh, yourself and more really reaching into some of the history books there and to bring us through, I think, as a historian in a small in a small way compared to your own statures, of course, uh, it does really remind me of the importance of uh, indeed putting history in its place, but also using it to inform today. I think there's a very indeed strong sense that the issues of today have never been done. They are always innovative because there is a small evolution that we haven't seen before and we label the entire phenomenon there uh, as an innovative approach, whereas in fact, indeed, it is a much more granular, much more evolutionary process as, as uh, Yannick has alluded to and as we've heard here today. Um, there are dozens, uh, several, almost two dozen questions come in now, so I want to give a few minutes to try and answer some of them. Uh, we will try to get through as many. There are a couple interesting questions, although we've spent a lot of Time in the past, trying to think a little bit more about the future together. Um, so there were a couple of questions around the likely sources of innovation um, going forward uh, for terrorists. We talked about uh, technological innovation related to climate change and the new technologies that develop there, or potentially uh, around the scientific evolution. We see a lot of effort now focused on uh, genetic understanding of COVID and, and what are the sort of the tools and the techniques that might evolve from uh, sort of a more scientific uh, and biological effort. Um, Yannick, I'll give you the floor to, to answer that. We haven't heard from you in a while, so nice to see you again. And uh, to think about as you were going through this historical effort uh, to try and find threads, are there things that you think we should be thinking about today that uh, speak to what we might deal with next year or, or next decade? Hi, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, so regarding the, the gene editing, aspect and the notion of biohacking. So this is one that personally I have to admit that I, I, I don't have a huge amount of expertise on uh, what the possibilities are. But what I find quite interesting with notion of gene editing and, and biohacking is that this is technology that five years ago would have been extremely expensive for individuals to harness. It would have been extremely difficult for people to tinker and play around with it. You need, you know, multi-million dollar labs and, and whatnot. And what we've seen is we've seen this democratization of this technology, a lot like we've seen a democratization of, of drone technology, of internet technology, of firearm technologies. So I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to think about potential ways that this could be used in a nefarious way. We do know that, that you know, terrorist groups have been interested in bioagents before. We know they've been used uh, interested in, in chemical agents uh, before. So the kind of legitimacy aspect of the equation seems to be taken care of. Uh, the, the two other questions that remain is one of feasibility. And I'd say that this technology is becoming more and more feasible and the question of effectiveness. And again, this is something that, that becomes extremely difficult for us to, to figure out how a terrorist group is going to look at a particular technology and kind of weigh in their, their, their outcome goal, but also their process goals and say, well, using you know, gene editing or CRISPR technology to engage in a terrorist attack is going to be useful. So there's definitely still some, a, a lot of unknowns there, uh, but if you kind of look at this, th at this singular thread of democratization uh, of technology that have this kind of dual purpose, to me, this is one of the, the obvious one that doesn't seem to be getting a great deal of attention uh, and probably won't get a great deal of attention until it's you know, sadly a bit too late. Hmm. And Maura, Tim, did you want to jump in either on that specific related to gene editing or other trends of democratization that might, that might be relevant to, to consider in this context? 
I'd be on very thin, thin ice if I expressed a view on, on, on gene editing. <laughs> I think, though, the point that Yannick powerfully makes about the importance of tinkerers and hobbyists, um, yeah. as I say, uh, Audrey Cronin said similar things, but I think that's enormously insightful. I think, uh, yes, the high tech end of the democracy and these things becoming more affordable is, is clearly important. Um, but I would also suggest, you know, there's a real power to um, sort of hybrid threats using high tech stuff in low tech ways. Um, this isn't about gene editing, but uh, the and it wasn't actually a terrorist attack, but the sort of disruption a couple of years back at Christmas at Gatwick Airport, someone just flying a do drone around the runway caused absolute mayhem. It's amazing there hasn't been more of that, but more, <laughs> more insightful. So I'll I'll shut up. Yeah. So so just to take up what what, what you said there, Tim. So um, uh, a lot of work, the work that I've done has been about you know um, online technologies and their uses, especially for propaganda and other purposes. But over the years, I've also contributed uh, more than a few words on what's often called cyber terrorism. Uh, and actually, um, uh, I, I contemplated uh, this afternoon speaking about cyber terrorism uh, because I, I, I think it's interesting to ask. It's a dog that hasn't barked, so I think it's an interesting one to. To, to ask and to think about in the context of this evolutionary theory. And I, I, I think you get to actually some pretty good uh, explanations for why no barking in that respect why things could change, you know, in terms of that, your whole point, Yannick, about propositional knowledge and whatnot. But just to go back to what you said one moment ago, Tim, one of the reasons it hasn't barked, in my opinion, is levels of complexity. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, you can do a lot better um, with a lot more low-tech uh, means. And you've just actually uh, des described one right there, the, the, the drones uh, at Heathrow. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of other uh, examples examples of where you might have some group or individual might have done some complicated high tech thing, but it was easier just uh, to use uh, uh, some group's knowledge of long knowledge of car bombing, which was a dead cert uh, and, and simply blow up, uh, you know, what, whatever they wish to, uh, whatever they wish uh, to uh, attack. So yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I appreciated your comments, Tim, about the, the dogs not barking, and, and I think the, uh, Yannick's uh, framework um, is useful not just to sort of trace potentially things that actually did evolve and work and, 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 and come to have some prominent role in things like airline hijacking, but also things that, that, that haven't been uh, employed or that have not been uh, employed yet, uh, as it were. Yeah, I do think that's a really interesting point. I mean, we often talk sort of on side sessions or over the lunch table, you know, at ICCT about all the different sort of what you used to, Tim, that sort of technique warehousing of all the things that, you know, we are surprised we don't see more of that we should be trying to think about it and sort of flag that there are concerns of here. But indeed, some of it comes down to, I think, in general, indeed, the the, the sort of a tool of uh, easiest resort. Huh? So you almost everyone can drive a car. Everyone, almost everyone can pick up a knife. Yes, of course, it is becoming easier to use technology, it is uh, gene technology, it is becoming easier to take cyber technology uh, into a more malevolent space, but it is still significantly harder than getting uh, a U-Haul truck and doing some damage. And if your objective is not to be most sophisticated, but to be most visible, there are some choices to be made there. I do think, indeed, there are arguments to be made about um, sort of showing what is possible. Indeed, the, the, the drone situation is, is a good one. So this is possible, and that sparks a whole security uh, response that is very expensive and can actually produce a lot of blowback when you're in a community. So there are social benefits within the terrorist community to innovate, even if it's not actually fatalities or, or, or violence. Uh, the state mechanisms that are forcing uh, a response, that force to respond, uh, are also, uh, in some ways, uh, quite powerful and and can be counterproductive. But um, yeah, super interesting conversation. I also was fascinated by the question on uh, red teams for terrorists, and that speaks a little bit more to, I guess, the question broader of intentionality of this evolution. Um, yeah, I mean, we we saw a lot of examples uh, of different groups trying something and then uh, you know succeeding or failing and moving on. But the notion of sort of red teaming or skunk works really implies a specific intentional effort by a group. Obviously, we talk about it now in the sort of more commercial or sort of security-minded agency thinking to to innovate as a as a as a modus uh, uh, as an idea in and of itself. Do we see? Uh, do you see in in your work that really intentional effort on innovation, or is it sort of a more uh, haphazard, evolutionary, this worked and this didn't uh, sort of happenstance. Uh, 
So I, I think this is one of the places where uh, giving credit to another scholar is, is definitely uh, important. So Adam Dolnick wrote a book uh, about 15 years ago looking at terrorist innovation as well. And he was particularly interested in the internal drivers uh, of terrorist innovation, which he focuses a chapter looking at the PFLP, um, the various innovation of, of hijacking, but also bombings and, and other forms of attack. And the thesis that he puts in his book is that the innovation came from the top, that there was a leader who was very much set on this type of innovation that I thought was particularly important. Therefore, that group was more likely to innovate. In my book, I have the chapter on uh, the 9-11 attack, and I try to, to make it clear how the final iteration of the 9-11 attack wasn't, or the final iteration of the 9-11 attack, what we saw happening was not what Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda started off with. In fact, it went through various uh, process uh, of essentially being drafted out and then simulated and thought of and then changed because of, of various constraints, both personal constraints, knowledge constraints, uh, but also geographical constraints. So, you know, some targets that were just too difficult to hit on a plane because where they're, they're, they're located and, and whatnot. So some groups, yes, definitely are doing this intellectual exercise. Uh, some more than other. Um, Ansar al-Islam in, in Iraq was particularly robust in trying to experiment with remote control technologies for VBIDs. Uh, so it seems to, I think Adam Dolnick it, it is onto something about the kind of internal uh, drivers for, for uh, innovation. But I think perhaps Mora might have some very good example of that as well from the, the cyber world. But, uh, what immediately actually pops uh, into my mind, and it goes just to your mention also, Yannick, of remote control, there's there's a, a, a book that I, do, I don't think um, gets the attention that it deserves, but maybe it's a little bit esoteric, but it's very detailed. You might like it, Yannick, if you haven't um, come across it yet. There's a guy called Andrew Oppenheimer wrote a book that's called IRA, The Bombs and the Bullets. And I was reminded of it uh, when I was uh, reading your uh, book, uh, because it's a very detailed accounting of the back and forth uh, between the provisional IRA and the British Army in terms of innovations uh, around uh, bomb making, uh, uh, bomb uh, interdiction and disposal uh, uh, um, uh, on, on the other side of things. Uh, and it is a wonderfully, if you can use it in inverted commas in this context, detailed account um, of precisely this back and forth that you that you talk about, where one side innovates, the, the other side rushes to come up with a technology or, or what have you that um that that that, that seeks to diminish um, the, the effect of this innovation, and 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 then the, the terrorists again come up with with something else that gets around that and and etc. And this sort of dialectical uh, relationship, and this is a very good accounting of that, including around the use of remote control uh, uh, devices, and then um, technologies developed by the British Army to interdict the remote control um, uh, um, detonation of, of bombs and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, for, for anybody who's interested in, in the minutiae of, 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 of some of this, um, I, I recommend that one to you. Super, thanks Mara. I do think there's definitely a sequel there in the sort of Iraq uh, and Afghanistan sequences of British uh, NATO, uh, wider sequences of evolution there, particularly related to uh, remote bombing that I Correct. haven't seen written up uh, in that sort of level of, of granularity. So maybe we all start that away for the for the next book that we write. And, uh, but yeah, great. It's an interesting example. Tim, did you want to add anything there? I, I'm happy to give you a chance. Um, thank you. Uh Yes, that is. A, I agree with more of that. That is a book with a lot of um, technical detail that is very thought provoking. There's a there's a good immersion scholar at Oxford too, Rachel Kowalski, who's um, I think will is really getting into the sort of um, technicalities of the provost campaign and what they achieved with with limited resources. As one of their bombers said, you know, we weren't good nuclear uh, physicians; <laughs> we're rather good electricians, and so they were. Um, I suppose, too, that's the sort of high end, um, high tech end. I'm sort of struck by diffusion techniques uh, and just something that was perhaps follows on for delayed thought on gene technology is that the currency of impact is visual. In an age of camera phones and uh, 
perpetual connectivity, um, you sort of need things to look dramatic. And I, I don't say it's the whole explanation, but I think that's part of the turn towards primitive techniques, actually, because, you know, what, frankly, 20, 30 years ago would have been well cleared up by the time the press photographers arrived. Now, be it vehicle ramming or knife attacks, it now occurs in the street full of camera phones and it, it can create, you can create much more dramatic footage with, with much more primitive means. So I think there is a sort of interesting synergy there between low tech means and, uh, and a technological revolution of, of broadcasting it. So some uh, half baked thoughts I thought I'd just serve up. <laughs> no, great. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that. I wanted to uh, recognize we're at time here. I do like this conversation. I, if it's okay with the panelists, I'm going to let it go on a little bit. I know we will lose some participants along the way. So for those who do need to drop off, uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, you'll indeed get a, a post survey uh, pop up here. So I'd love if you just spend 30 more seconds of your time to answer that. We will also share the recording uh, that has been made of this event on YouTube uh, back with you for anyone uh, that you think in your your colleagues or, or professional community would benefit from reading it or uh, watching it rather. So please uh, take a look out for that and, and we hope to see you at our next event. Um, Yannick, I wanted to come back. There are a couple different questions related more specifically to the methodology in your book. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask a question around sort of the uh, the process you present is sort of uh, demonstrates a sort of linear effort here. So we start and we move from one to the other to the other. And in reality, we know that that is, uh, you know, it's never quite as neat as that. Can you speak a little bit to sort of the, uh, I guess, the parallel innovations or the sort of efforts to be innovating amongst multiple uh, vertices at the same time? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the... <laughs> That's one of the things that makes doing these kind of long genealogical studies particularly difficult is that you don't only have one actor, you've got several actors. And there's also a question of how much rift is happening here. Um, particularly while relational ties is generally, you know, it leaves traces. You know, people have, have pictures of people meeting, people have records of people meeting. The non-relational stuff is, is particularly difficult, right? Um, and this is where essentially you have to start looking at what is the balance of probability that this particular incident influenced another incident as opposed to, to saying, well, you know, this was invented completely uh, me. Um, and there, there's a couple of ways of doing this. I, I'm working on a paper right now doing something quite similar uh, with, with two colleagues of mine, including Chelsea Damon, uh, looking at the evolution of, of far-right terrorist attacks and essentially how they influence each other. And again, it makes it very difficult. If you're not able to interview or talk directly with the perpetrators, you have to try to figure out, okay, so how much media attention was there around a particular event? Is it likely that a second perpetrator would have copied that particular aspect of the technique? Or is it just by, you know, is it just by design that this is the most efficient way of doing a particular attack? So that's that's one of the things that, that that's problematic. I think throughout the book, I've tried to support the claims at least with a, a good amount of, um, of anecdotal evidence that would lead to the belief like non-relational transmission when that occurs. Um, but, you know, as Tim hinted to, I, I made the argument that, you know, this was invented by the Peruvian and then later was invented in Cuba, you know, 20 <laughs> years later. If somebody finds, you know, Fidel Castro or Raul Castro's diary and, you know, he says, you know, when I was eight years old, I read this article about proven revolutionary. Well, I'm going to have to write a second volume uh, correcting that. But on on the balance, I think this is essentially the best way we can we can try to make these in depth genealogy. Yeah, super. Yeah, Tim, I see your hand up there. I, just a very brief comment, uh, and you know, all due respect to Yannick for grappling with that, because I've grappled with with similar issues uh, in recent work. Actually, with sort of pro-state violence, I was very struck by, you know, I make an argument that the sort of emergence of the modern death squad after the First World War is predicated upon uh, mass vehicle ownership. You can't really have the death squad without cars and lorries. It's all about abducting victims. Uh, but what is remarkable is the same, pretty much the same things just seems to happen over and over again independently that, you know, whether it's far right death squads in Weimar, Germany, whether it's uh, death squads in the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary in, in Belfast, um, and, uh, and, and, and some other places, similar stuff in, uh, 
uh, Finland and, and just a few years after in the Spanish Civil War. And you know, they all basically do the same thing. You abduct a victim, you take them a short uh, distance, you shoot them, then you leave them in a public park. And it's always on the outskirts of a town. Um, and it's often been uh, attributed to Chicago gangsters. And I think Hollywood may do something to defuse it. I think, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, in the Spanish Civil War, that seems to be the model. But the earlier ones, just sort of 1919, 1920, it seems to crop up in about three or four different places and pretty much exactly the same modus operandi. Um, actually trying to untangle that genealogy, uh, you know, is that prescriptive knowledge? Is that learned knowledge? It's hard. Intriguing, yeah. but, but baffling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to maybe just ask one more question. I thought it was interesting uh, reflection on this general conversation and uh, the work of uh, all of you as, as terrorism scholars, and then I'll try to wrap up. And there is a question here about sort of the duty of, of concern that we have around sort of showcasing innovation, showcasing new methodologies, you know, talking about the tactical warehousing, flagging historical events and techniques. Um, you know, by definition, it introduces new ideas. It pulls up different uh, lessons from the past that perhaps because we are dealing with uh, quite a, an unsavory subject, there is some uh, concern around what, what we do to perhaps inspire the next generation of terrorists by simply studying the past generation. So actually, I was curious, because you've all studied historical violence in various contexts, how you, I guess, maybe a minute or two from each of you to just reflect on what you feel the connection is between your work and the potential uh, I mean, your work in the broader sense, not a specific piece of publication, but the field's uh, effort to study historical and how much that actually impacts the evolution of terrorist thinking and, and techniques. And Maura, I see you puzzling there, so I'm going to give you the floor uh, to try and uh, to give me give me a minute on, on that if you can. It's a, it's a good question. Um... I, I, I guess I've, I've heard it uh, previously in, in the context in particular, I guess, of my own work about online uh, and what have you. And, um, and in, in, in some respects, getting into some of the, the nitty gritty, I guess, some of the concerns that uh, people have uh, oftentimes and over the years with respect to online is, um, for example, uh, drawing, um, let's call it publics or large numbers of individuals attention, um, you know, to specific online spaces, uh, for example, uh, yes. that are um, um, like terrorist websites or um, online jihadi forums or particular uh, channels or um, accounts yeah. of major social media websites and that kind of thing. So I guess if I'm thinking of it from a more sort of practical researcher um, perspective, I do think there are ethical uh, questions that arise uh, with respect uh, to that, uh, for example. And, and I would say in, in very early work I did in, in the uh, ends of the 1990s and the beginnings of the 2000s, I was interested in terrorist websites that had begun to emerge in the mid 1990s. And one of the things in my opinion that they were definitely uh, very interested in doing was getting the URLs of their websites websites uh, into major press uh, outlets, so into the international press. And, and if the URL was there, I think that was a major win. But even just the mention of the website at that time was a, a pretty significant sort of PR coup uh, yeah. for them because that means that they could get new traffic uh, to their site and it cut out the middleman, which is the, which was the, the, the journalist uh, and whatnot. And obviously, we see things evolved uh, uh, over time. And so I, I guess this remains somewhat of a concern. And, and I do think um, it, it's good. We're beginning to talk more about some of these issues uh, in terrorism studies now, about some of the sort of headline ethical issues, along with some of the more uh, nitty uh, gritty uh, stuff, uh, in, in, in including, you know, um, uh, uh, potentially, I guess, bribing users uh, to particular uh, online spaces that might be extremist or terrorist in their orientation. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. People have a, a, a diversity of views, it has to be said, on this uh, issue. Um, but I, I do think we have certain responsibilities as researchers. <laughs> 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, that just reminds me of the work that you know, we have an ICCT project, and I know this is being done in a number of other instances and organizations as well about sort of also the efforts of uh, journalists and sort of training media and other practitioners to also understand that by simply covering stories, by doing research in these areas, you run the risk of introducing ideas, uh, you know, propaganda, other powerful tools that actually you're serving the longer term interests of these organizations by simply spotlighting them. So there is a tension. We want to do the work, of course, but we have to be thoughtful about how it's presented and managed. Um, Tim, uh, um, thoughts on that? <laughs> I, I very much an echo chamber answer in some ways. I think, uh, yes, of course, we have to be thoughtful. I do think, though, we also have to be a little bit skeptical. I'm talking primarily from a UK perspective, but uh, there is something of a culture of what I call, um, you know, neo pacifist totalitarianism. In other words, if you look at violence, you somehow suspect yourself. You know, compared to researching the IRA back in the day, you'd have the Green Book and the in the in the college library and no one thought anything of it. Now it, it all becomes a lot more, you know, for sometimes very good reasons actually, but it all becomes a lot more febrile, a lot more sensitive. I do I, I don't think that lets us off the hook. Of course we have to think about our responsibilities. Um, but do we want to understand this stuff better either because it's intellectually compelling uh, or because there may be societal benefits for those in positions of authority, security forces or whatever, police, uh, who could benefit from learning this stuff better. Um, but I think also some sense of perspective, and I think you've just kind of touched on it there yourself, Alexander, you know, I think that terrorists are going to probably, most cases, whoever they are, probably first port of call is um, YouTube rather than, you know, terrorism and political violence academic journal. I just think that, you know, in terms of reach, I, I know, I hate to pick all our bubbles. I know we, <laughs> we all think what we do is incredibly compelling and important, and it hopefully it is. Uh, but, you know, just in terms of reach, let, let, yeah. let's keep a sense of proportion. And I think, you know, the, uh, we, you know, I think a lot of the onus is actually, as you say, on journalists. If one looks at the kind of institutional memory amongst mass shooters, the learning of techniques, uh, Brenton Tarrant, Anders Breivik, you know, putting the headphones on, getting in the zone, taking drugs, corralling your victims, making sure they're indoors in a nightclub or an island or wherever it is. There's a kind of, you know, and racking up these huge mass shooter death totals of sort of 50 or so. It's, you know, several times what, you know, classic massacres like Bloody Sunday in Dublin in 1920 didn't kill nearly that many. Um, you know, so there's a kind of, there's a, a horrible dark learning there. Uh, yes, we may contribute to it inadvertently and we have to think about that, but I think there are other more powerful drivers generally. Yeah, fair point. I think that's a fair counterbalance. Yeah, and Yannick, last word is to you on this or any other, I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Any other thoughts you wanted to leave uh, the, the substantial viewers that are still with us? Uh, with? So on this, just very briefly, I think what's interesting is that this is not a new debate. Uh, when I was writing the book, going through archival uh, documents from the FAA, is the amount of desperate plea from FAA officials to journalists asking them not to report about particular technicalities of hijacking or even asking them, um, asking uh, networks to stop broadcasting certain movies because there was a correlation between mm. when they've showed a particular movie and then people trying to essentially enact the same plot. Thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, this is something that, that we have to be mindful of, but like a lot of things we deal with, there is a long history of these debates and these concerns that I think we need yeah. to address and think about. Super. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, the three of you, for joining today. I really enjoyed this debate. Also nice that it's lively, also driven by questions from the audience. So thanks, everyone, for asking those. Um, we will leave it here for today and uh, hope to see you at our next event uh, soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Yannick. Congratulations. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye-bye.